Hello everyone, I am Peter Tennant and I'm a University Academic Fellow in Health Data Science at the University of Leeds and I'm also a Fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, that's the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence and uh, I'm going to be talking about diabetes in pregnancy and the risk of stillbirth. So, if you don't already know, the UK has one of the highest stillbirth prevalence proportions in Europe and indeed amongst uh, most of the high income countries. Um, it currently sits at around three in a thousand births, at least um, in the third trimester. And there's a number of possible explanations for this. Um, higher rates of uh, smoking in pregnancy, obesity in pregnancy, uh, higher uh, average maternal age, uh, the use of alcohol and other substances, and of course, um, lower uh, uh, amounts of spending on the provision of healthcare. But the factor with perhaps the strongest influence on stillbirth is diabetes. Um, we've known for a number of years that women with pre-existing diabetes, that's type one or type two, have a three to six times um, higher risk of stillbirth. Um, and indeed, uh, in uh, this paper in uh, 2014, we found that um, the risk of stillbirth increased really quite sharply um, for any increase in um, uh, blood glucose concentration here, HbA1c, um, as you went above um, uh, what looks like an idealized level of about uh, 50 millimoles per mole. But the effect of pre-existing um, diabetes is fairly well known. What is less known and subject of an awful lot more debate is the effect of gestational diabetes. For those who don't know, gestational diabetes is a form of hyperglycemia, often a little bit milder than pre-existing, that arises specifically in pregnancy. It affects between 5 and 15% um, of all pregnancies in the UK um, and worldwide, depending on which diagnostic criteria are used. In the UK, we detect gestational diabetes and we diagnose gestational diabetes by um, looking at the fasting plasma glucose concentration and by conducting oral glucose tolerance tests um, between uh, the twen around 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy. And we do this to women who are considered to be at high risk or at some kind of elevated risk of gestational diabetes. And that comes either from having um, a South Asian or Black Caribbean background, uh, an obese BMI, a previous history of gestational diabetes, previous history of macrosomia, that's a very large baby, or a family history of diabetes. Now, at the moment in the UK and worldwide, women who are diagnosed with gestational diabetes receive an intensive package of enhanced antenatal care. And there's actually a very heavy debate about the relative costs and uh, benefits uh, of this um, programme, not just in terms of the screening, but in terms of um, the care that is then delivered. And one of the reasons for that is that if you look at the um, observed association, for example, between gestational diabetes and the risks of stillbirth or perinatal death, then you see apparently very, very weak effects. So these are three studies um, uh, specifically, and they all found um, looking at stillbirth or perinatal death, uh, at what you might call quite an anemic um, effect on um, the risk of these outcomes. And as a consequence of this, there isn't really a um, agreed definition on exactly what level of hyperglycemia, particularly what level of mild hyperglycemia is enough to warrant a diagnosis of gestational diabetes. And this is where you see quite a divergence between uh, the UK and the kind of care that women will receive um, from the NHS um, and um, elsewhere in the world, particularly the USA. Um, because um, the WHO and the American Diabetes Association very much recommend the criteria 
um, developed by the International Association of Diabetes in Pregnancy Study Groups. That's on the left. Whereas um, the NHS recommends following the criteria of the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And I think the key difference here is about what happens based on the fasting plasma glucose. The women um, are on the left, essentially in America and uh, many other countries, um, if their fasting plasma glucose is above 5.1, then they'll be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. However, um, if you're in the UK, then you need to be above 5.6. And that is not a small difference. In reality, that means that somewhere between about 30 and 40% of all the women who would be diagnosed on the left do not get diagnosed on the right. Now, this uh, judgment about what the appropriate cutoff is, is based, of course, on um, observational data. It's very difficult con to conduct a trial um, for these kind of um, exposures and outcomes. Uh, but there's a big problem here, which is that the apparent effect of gestational diabetes, as indeed the apparent effects of any disease, um, in most um, real world data are not treatment naive. So that means that most women with hyperglycemia in pregnancy will go on to get diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And that in the world we live in at the moment, women diagnosed with gestational diabetes will then receive this enhanced package of antenatal care. So the association that we observe and the apparent effect of hyperglycemia is actually a conflation of these two things. We see a conflation of the harmful biological effect of hyperglycemia and of the beneficial kind of clinical effect of providing enhanced antenatal care. So if we really want to know the effect of mild hyperglycemia or gestational diabetes um, when it's not treated compared to when it's treated, in order to ask questions about, whether or about how harmful it is and about whether or not we should be making intervention, then we need to be separating these two things. We need to separate that harmful element from that beneficial element. And unfortunately, that requires... Um, a little thought um, and then in practice realistically requires that we use um, a series of uh, analytical methods that are slightly different maybe to the conventional approaches but fall under this um, contemporary um, umbrella of causal inference methods. And um, I'm going to briefly mention just two um, analyses which use different causal inference methods to try and estimate these two things. The first of these, which is a causal mediation analysis, many of you may already know about this study. Um, it came out a couple of years ago. Um, obviously, um, uh, it's a little bit less current, having waited a year um, uh, to present this uh, because of COVID. Um, but I think um, it's still um, extremely salient and a, a very important way of demonstrating the point. So you can conduct a causal mediation analysis whenever there is um, imperfect um, adherence to protocol in a sense, um, because what you need to see is good overlap between, let's say, levels of hyperglycemia and whether or not people are diagnosed um, with uh, gestational diabetes. And the analysis then seeks to partition um, those two effects essentially by comparing what happened to the different women who fall in the different groups, depending on whether they had normal or raised uh, blood glucose and whether they were diagnosed or not. Um, it is more difficult, um, indeed it's impossible to perform a causal mediation analysis when there is um, very strict protocol adherence. Um, in other words, where diagnosis depends very, very strongly um, on the exposure that you're interested in. Um, or, so in this situation, we have to use an alternative approach, um, and one option is a so-called regression discontinuity analysis. So the aim of this essentially is to look at the discontinuous boundary that is created by the fact that women get diagnosed at a very specific cutoff, and then to try and compare what happened 
to similar women either side of that boundary. So I'll just briefly cover the um, first uh, study first. So this is the causal mediation analysis. Uh, this is the, the BJOG study from 2019. It was um, conducted in the Midlands and North of England stillbirth study. That's a case control study of 41 maternity units in the North of England um, during April 2014 to March 2016. It recruited singleton late stillbirths or the cases were singleton late stillbirths. And then the controls were randomly selected ongoing pregnancies that were matched on gestation. The study excluded anyone with pre-existing diabetes where the pregnancy was affected by congenital anomaly or where the mother was under 16 years. And then that left an analytical sample of 94 cases and 277 cases who had all been screened for gestational diabetes. So the idea there essentially in that smaller sample was to look at this um, quite small um, sort of um, causal system um, where we have the exposure, fasting plasma glucose level, partially determining diagnosis and in um, return enhanced care. But the reason why this was possible in this study at the time was fasting plasma glucose was not routinely used certainly in these hospitals uh, when this study was performed for the basis of diagnosis. So and there are a number of women who have raised fasting plasma glucose who did not get diagnosed. And likewise, there are women who had normal levels of fasting plasma glucose who were diagnosed based on, on other things such as their oral glucose tolerance test. The mediator that we're then interested in is essentially an instrument for the receipt, receipt of enhanced care. Were they clinically diagnosed? We are not saying that diagnosis in itself confers some kind of magical benefits. What we're saying is once a woman is diagnosed with gestational diabetes, then she is pushed down a radically different care pathway. And therefore, by looking at the difference between those who are diagnosed and not, we can try and estimate the benefits of that care pathway. This is an observational story. There is, of course, um, likely to be plenty of confounding. Um, and um, I used um, modern uh, methods to try and identify and uh, account for the confounding. Uh, this is a, essentially a summary of the underlying um, causal diagram. But um, just so you know, the, 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 the assumption is that the variables on the left um, are causing uh, the variables in the middle. And then the, the two of those are in turn causing uh, the, the system that we're analyzing on the right. So in order to get rid of confounding, we have to close all of those spurious paths. And, and essentially that means adjusting for them all. But what were the results? That's the important bit. Well, um, they were quite startling, far more startling indeed than I had expected. I was perhaps more skeptical myself of the benefit um, of being diagnosed with GDM and of uh, the impact that that would have on your risk. Um, in reality, um, what we found was um, when comparing women who had a higher as in a diabetic FPG um, and were not diagnosed to women who had a lower as in non-diabetic FPG and were not diagnosed and none of these women were diagnosed. Then you saw that that raised glucose consistent with gestational diabetes was associated with around a four times higher risk of stillbirth, which I think is not trivial. However, this, let's have a look what happens in the women with a gestational diabetes levels of fasting plasma glucose. Let's what happen, see what happens when you compare those who were subsequently diagnosed and therefore receive all, all of that care to those who are not. Well, they, they end up with around um, a third of the overall risk of stillbirth. So what you're seeing here is that for women with equally equal biological risks that receiving that diagnosis and everything that comes with it is an enormous uh, 
um, benefit to them. If you were to conduct the naive analyses and simply compare women diagnosed with GDM who have a, therefore, a diagnostic um, uh, fasting plasma glucose to women who were not diagnosed and therefore, you know, did not um, have a, a diagnostic level, then you would see a considerably more anemic effect because in essentially these two things almost cancel each other out such that the, the natural effect um, looks uh, very, very modest. And I think it's really quite stark when you um, compare that number to the number that we've seen reported elsewhere. So when you do the naive analysis that, that, that uh, compares um, without considering uh, the fact that um, diagnosis is in itself an intervention, then you get an apparent effect of gestational diabetes that is almost identical to all of the previous studies that have been published. So I think there's quite a strong suggestion there that this modest effect that the literature has suggested is actually um, hiding a very um, large um, differential between the, the, the true impact of untreated hyperglycemia and then the benefit um, of antenatal care. Of course, one of the key questions that always comes up in this um, kind of analysis is, did you see any particular level of cutoff where the risk really increased? Um, and the answer is absolutely not. We see a very smooth, continuous association between increasing fasting plasma glucose levels and increasing risk of stillbirth. So the idea that you can draw a line down there at 5.6 um, uh, based on biology it, it is nonsense. That decision clearly um, is, is one that has to be made um, based on other factors such as politics, pragmatism um, and the availability of resource. Now, you might quite reasonably say, well, this is just one study um, and um, perhaps uh, it's a fluke. Um, nobody else has conducted a similar type of analysis in any other populations, so it's quite reasonable to be sceptical. And as a consequence, uh, Dr. Thomasina Stacey and myself um, and a number of her colleagues have attempted um, to perform uh, a confirmatory analysis um, in routine data. This time, because of much tighter uh, protocol um, adherence, we've had to perform a regression discontinuity analysis because um, in this sample, um, FPG was very much used now for diagnosis. Um, it's a much smaller sample because it comes from uh, two uh, district general hospitals um, in the three years between 2017 and 2019. Um, this is uh, um, un uh, currently unpublished work, by the way. Um, it included singleton births again, um, we excluded pre-existing diabetes again and ended up with around 7,000 women um, who were screened for GDM. And uh, the, the, this, the system that we're trying to unpick is essentially exactly the same as the one we saw before. Um, we're interested in both the effect of fasting plasma glucose and clinical diagnosis of GDM as a proxy for the receipt of care. Um, but here it has to be um, analysed slightly differently because the relationship between FPG and getting diagnosed is extremely um, unnatural in that whilst you see an increasing likelihood of diagnosis um, up to 5.6, then obviously because of the NICE criteria, um, we then see a massive jump and the vast majority um, of women at 5.6 or above going on to be diagnosed with GDM. So um, if in theory a regression discontinuity approach um, does not need um, adjustment for confounding, however in theory you should also have a very large sample size and be choosing a very small window around the boundary. Now because pragmatically that wasn't possible in this case, I have made um, adjustment for the um, confounders that um, I believed are most important and that were um, available um, in order to try and um, uh, get rid of any other 
differences between those um, underneath 5.6 and those above. So what about the results? Well, when you look at fetal and neonatal death, uh, you actually see very little. Um, and the reason for this, of course, is that it's a very small sample and it's uh, not really capable of picking up um, uh, the signal from a very rare outcome such as um, stillbirth. So although we see um, maybe you know, a very slight, you can see on the, uh, the left there that the risk goes up by a very slight but incredibly uncertain amount for each additional millimole per litre. And likewise, um, the risk deflates slightly but with huge uncertainty when there's a diagnosis. I really would take that with a pinch of salt. If you look at the softer outcomes, however, you do see um, the pattern um, being repeated with a lot more confidence. So if you look at shoulder dystocia um, as an outcome, then you see that for each increase millimole per litre in FPG, then the risk is essentially doubling and the receipt of a diagnosis essentially leads to a half of that risk. And then for LGA, the effect is particularly strong. Again, a doubling for each um, millimole per liter increase in FPG. But look at that, you've actually got the risk um, of LGA collapsing um, by down to just one third um, when there is that diagnosis. So um, in practice, if you actually look at the, the natural results, so to speak, this is what um, it looks like. You see um, increasing probability of LGA for women as they approach um, the diagnostic threshold and then quite a dramatic drop um, and then they begin increasing again thereafter. And I just wanted to put this number, um, this, this association in, in real numbers because I think this is very important. For a, women, for a woman who has an FPG level of 5.5, so who has mild hyperglycemia, then in the UK would not be diagnosed. Um, this is the difference. If they are not diagnosed, their risk is over a third of LGA. That's about 35%. If they are diagnosed, it falls down to 12%. I think in real terms, that is a stark change um, that we really need to think about um, whether women just below that threshold actually are missing out by receiving standard care whilst actually being at increased risk. So just to summarise, studies of the effects of gestational diabetes on stillbirth really need to consider and separate the harmful effects of the hyperglycemia from the beneficial effects of receiving enhanced care. Stacey 2019 from BJOB showed that if you do a kind of naive analysis of the total effect, then you'll see what everyone else has seen, which is apparently GDM has a very small effect on stillbirth. But if you separate that out into its two components, then in fact, the, the, the risk due to the hyperglycemia is very, very high. And that's currently being masked by surprisingly effective care. Um, in our unpublished regression discontinuity analyses, then we see a very similar pattern, at least for some of the other outcomes. And at the least, I think there is a confirmation of this benefit of diagnosis. What we see from both is that there's not necessarily any biological justification for choosing one threshold over another. That's clearly a decision that's going to be based um, on resource. And so what that means in the UK is that choosing that higher threshold um, for FPG is placing a lot of women at an increased risk um, compared with elsewhere in the world. Um, and I think what would be really handy is if we could work out exactly what it is about being diagnosed with GDM and everything that then happens that is so effective, because clearly um, there's something really good going on and it would be great to know exactly what that is so we can roll it out perhaps a little bit more cost effectively. Um, I obviously thank the Diabetes UK organising committee for inviting me, thank those who funded the first study and my primary collaborator Thomasina Stacey um, and all the others who have been involved.